Good morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I am so grateful to be worshiping with you on this morning, and I certainly wanted to honor the senior minister, Reverend Livingston, for extending the invitation. And it's also wonderful to see some familiar faces uh, in the church on this morning, uh, some close friends of mine that are members uh, of this church. So with that being said, let us pray. Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, we have gathered together to hear a word that might comfort, inspire, and give us strength for the journey ahead. Let us hear your word and be doers of it. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We have been through quite a lot over this past year and a half. To start, we have been on lockdown, and this has tested many of us in unexpected ways. For example, we couldn't go get our favorite cup of coffee and people watch while we drank it. We couldn't visit our favorite restaurant in person to eat and fellowship with our friends. And although we love our spouses, partners, and children, I know I love my spouse and my child, we couldn't leave for some time to regain our sanity and a fresh perspective before returning to live with them 24-7. But on a more sober note, we have also witnessed numberless deaths, perhaps even the sickness and death of our loved ones. We have confronted and lamented forms of social and political hatred, especially as experienced by marginalized groups such as African Americans and Asian Americans. Some have experienced financial ruin in the pandemic. Even personal exhaustion has been a constant companion during this unprecedented time. We have lived with anxiety, sadness, and uncertainty, even as we have also experienced our personal joys and hopes. I had a baby in the pandemic. Her name, Ariella Rose. She is a large glimmer of light in what has felt like terrible darkness for my community and our larger nation and world. So a few months ago, I began preparing to conclude my maternity leave, to go back into the classroom. Needless to say, I felt anxious. The demands with going back to work were many, especially needing to figure out how to be both mother and professor. This led me to feeling a familiar guilt. I felt guilty when I was resting, as in I could be doing something more productive, I could be doing academic work or housework, but then I felt guilty when I was working, as in I should be resting, I should be leaning into greater self-care. I was sad that my family, my mother, my father, sisters and brothers did not live closer to me or I to them to help with my transition to motherhood or that I could not at least feel their hugs and love. I was anxious, even scared about my unvaccinated baby daughter and her health and safety going to childcare and my heart ached for the larger social and political issues affecting us. Questions lingered in my mind, such as, will people in this country care enough about each other to wear masks and get vaccinated? How will our political leaders help millions of people who are still out of work due to COVID? What will become of women's reproductive choices given the draconian law state legislatures, such as Texas, are passing? What would this year bring? because I had had enough, we have had enough. And so I must admit, before the semester even got started at Princeton Theological Seminary, I was weary and heavy laden. And I found myself grappling with a couple of questions, questions I wanna pose to you on this morning. 
What does it mean to rest when you're weary? Is there rest for the stressed? A few months ago, I remember turning to the Matthew 11 passage we read, especially the 28th verse, where Jesus says, Come to me, all that who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I read it in my office, and I decided to live with this scripture for a few months, to let it breathe new life into me. For I realized that I didn't really understand, nor had I applied myself to this kind of spiritual rest that Jesus talks about. And I realized I am not alone. There are others who are feeling weary, people who feel anxious, uncertain, depressed, in short, heavy laden. So then in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, we meet Jesus saying, come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I want to note that prior to Jesus saying this, a lot had transpired. At the start of Matthew 11, John the Baptist found himself in prison for simply preaching a Messiah and prophet who was filled with love and on a mission to do justice. Despite preaching this good news, John finds himself in prison facing death. Matthew 11 begins with an account of John's question from prison and Jesus' response. John asked Jesus, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Notice the anxiety and uncertainty undergirding John's question, are you the one? After all, John is in prison and wants to urgently know if Jesus is the political Messiah in light of his potential impending death. And in considering John's question, we need to think through the messianic expectations of the people during that time a bit more. Most Jewish people expected a Messiah who would expel the Roman oppressors from the land and establish a kingdom of righteousness and peace. They did not expect and did not understand that Jesus would not do that but would die at Roman hands. So I imagine the people as well as his disciples who at the time had every reason to believe Jesus would be the political Messiah and help them overthrow Rome similar to John, that they felt sad, disillusioned, perhaps even despondent over their mission with Jesus. Is he the one? John is filled with anxiety and restlessness, wanting to know with certainty Jesus responds to John's question by emphatically offering a list of what he has done. In other words, he offers his receipts. He says, the lame walk, the sick are healed, people are liberated. Jesus responds with his deeds to remind John and the others surrounding him that he is who he says he is. Jesus confirms his mission in the face of growing unpopularity and uncertainty. This is Jesus' own situation, a situation that could sponsor anxiety and restlessness in any of us. To have your intentions and ministry questioned, to feel unfairly distrusted and betrayed by the very people you lifted up and encouraged. Yet Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me. And Jesus says, in coming to me, do not rely on your own strength. You are not alone in this fight. You do not have to suffer in silence. You do not have to feel shame and blame for being weary. You do not need to employ strategies like sleeping or shopping to cope with your weariness. You do not need to cry as if without hope. No, Jesus says, come to me, the source of life, love, and peace, and I will give you rest. Now notice, Jesus says, I will give you rest. What an image 
the image of a gift. This gift of rest is free of charge. Jesus says, I will give you rest, free of charge in a society with me which measures everything by the quid pro quo, what you can do for me and I can do for you. Jesus says, I will give you rest, free of charge in an era that privileges material things over non-material things that can never be measured by monetary value. He says, I will give you rest, free of charge, a gift in abundance in a social and political context today that always offers with strings attached. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your soul. Rest for what plagues your mind, heart, and your emotions. I will give you rest. What a promise. But Jesus indicates that it's not just about resting. It's about how we rest. He addresses the how of resting. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What did Jesus mean, take my yoke upon you and learn from me? I realize how unfamiliar we might be with the image of a yoke. Even agricultural communities are so mechanized today that yokes are unused. A yoke is a means of governing an animal and linking two or more animals for greater strength. While I was teaching English as a second language in India when I was in college, I was in the state of Gujarat in a small rural town called Baroda. I got to see a real yoke. And remembering what it looked like, I cannot imagine willingly taking on a yoke. The idea of a yoke is totally counter to my love of personal freedom, not to mention goes against my staunch opinion related to animal rights. I want to do it all my way. A yoke makes me feel like I am restrained as I look at the yoke in India. But Jesus uses this idea metaphorically. His language of a yoke is about one voluntarily yielding to and linking with divine direction and guidance, and in this way, receiving greater strength for the spiritual journey ahead. Jesus' yoke it's perhaps his teachings and life practices related to rest, both physical and spiritual. We watch Jesus engaging in rest in a variety of contexts to be renewed and restored mentally and physically. Jesus, as a human, experienced uncertainty but knew that rest for his body, mind, and emotions were central to understanding God and his place in God's plan more deeply. So consider Mark chapter four, verses 35 through 40, where Jesus directs his disciples to break away from the crowds, get in the boat and go to the other side. The disciples get in the boat and while in the boat, a storm comes. Yet Jesus is asleep in the boat. Jesus awakes to the disciples screaming at him, indicting him, asking, don't you care if we drown? You sleep in the face of us potentially perishing. So of course, Jesus must wake up. Jesus calms the storm and he turns to his disciples and asks, why are you afraid? Here's what is so great to me at least about this passage. Jesus sees that there is work to be done. He sees the crowd. He knows people need to be healed. The hungry need to be fed. The poor and outcast need to be affirmed and encouraged and lessons need to be taught. But he still tells his disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side away from the crowds. 
and once on the boat, Jesus falls asleep. Yes, the needs of the people were urgent and their requests or cries for healings must have been compelling, but Jesus knew that he needed to stop and rest. He needed to stop and rest to experience physical and spiritual restoration because Jesus knew that our bodies are our only vehicles through which to do God's work in the world. Jesus, is need, Jesus needed to stop and rest to clear his mind and heart to not feel overwhelmed by the demands of ministry, the demands made by the people. He needed to stop and rest to live more courageously into what he had been called to be and do in the world, especially in the face of his opponents. He needed to stop and rest if his heart was to, re to remain open to his call and mission with all of its twists and turns and disappointments and uncertainties. If even Jesus needed to stop and rest in the midst of the demands and at times the chaos of life, don't you think we need to honor rest as well? Jesus wanted the disciples to think about why they were afraid in the boat. They were afraid because they had not yet tapped into the profound power of trusting the one who sent them, that God would be present with them no matter what ultimately happened in the boat that God holds their lives in God's hands no matter what situation they found themselves in. Rest gave Jesus perspective. To not panic, but instead to yield to the fact that while we cannot control the situation life presents, we can respond in a way that affirms our trust in the God who has formed us and made us in this moment to do the work of love and justice. This is what he wanted the disciples to understand. Jesus reminds us that as we fight the good fight of faith, we must also find reservoirs of rest for ourselves, for our minds, our hearts, our souls, so that we might sustain the work that we do. So then Jesus' teachings on spiritual rest function like a yoke in our lives. They help to govern and steer us in directions that foster renewed purpose and hope. And while yokes may have been forced on animals centuries ago, Jesus is clear that we might choose to take his yoke, his teachings upon us. It's our choice. The yoke of Jesus is never forced on us. And this yoke is light, it says in the scripture. Jesus does not force, does not demean through his teachings and life. He is not like the religious and political authorities of his day and even in our day that often shame and blame the masses in order to teach and govern them. No, Jesus desires to teach us collaboratively and in love. We must make a decision to put on that yoke. The same way we make decisions about what we will eat, where we will work, and whom we will love. Taking Jesus' yoke upon me is about surrendering to a higher power and knowing that there is a force greater than myself who will right the wrongs of this world even if I don't live to see it. Taking Jesus' yoke upon me is about surrendering as Jesus did to the fact that while I might not see perfect justice or love actualized, God goes before me and will go after me to complete the work of love and justice within and beyond the histories of this world. So as we decide to take the path of Jesus, the Spirit will join with us and teach us the ways of peace, love, justice, and yes, my friends, even how to rest our anxious minds and hearts. We must be taught how to rest. One final insight about spiritual rest. I felt tremendous grace when I discovered the nap ministry. <laughs> I never really did naps well, and even with the eight-month-old daughter, I still don't do naps well, which is a tragedy. The nap ministry was started by a black woman who is referred to as the nap bishop, Trisha Hersey, and it is an organization that examines the liberating power of naps. 
When I first entered their website, I was delighted by the first question that they posed to the reader. How will you be useless to capitalism today? <laughs> How will you be useless to capitalism today? For the NAP ministry, rest can be resistance in a society that treats us as cogs in the machine of capitalist profit. For the NAP ministry, rest can also, also foster delight and restoration, key elements needed to sustain not just justice work, but who we are as humans. The NAP ministry encourages both individual and collective NAP experiences in many different venues, in parks, museums, living rooms, conferences, so that persons and communities might learn how to center rest as central to who they are and what they do. The NAP ministry invites us into deep study on the practice of rest as a community, to learn how to rest in order to experience delight and restoration, how to live better as a human being and not become a slave to the personal, political, and economic pressures of life. The NAP ministry for me sits in the tradition of our scripture today. It models Jesus' invitation to embrace rest for our souls. So is there rest for the stress? Yes, because Jesus says, come unto me, those who feel anxious and sad, and I will give you rest. Come unto me, those who feel bogged down with endless experiences and worries associated with the pandemic, and I will give you rest. Come to me, those who have lost a beloved one and feel the void every single day, and I will give you rest. Come to me, those who feel depleted while fighting for the political and economic needs of others, and I will give you rest. Come to me, those who are disenfranchised for their race and socioeconomic status or hated for who they love, and I will give you rest. Come to me, those who feel confused about what their future might be, and I will give you rest. Come to me, those who fight chronic diseases in their body, and I will give you rest. Come to me all those who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, rest for your soul. There is rest for the stressed. Amen.